This is Duke University. It is a pleasure to introduce Thomas LeCur. That's how I would normally begin if Thomas LeCur were a normal historian, but he is. And so today he's going to share with us his medical and moral meditations on death and life, and talk to us about the work that we do on the dead. <coughs> he also has written about individual death, the death of his father, his grandfather, uh, the myth of a good death, the pleasure of public executions, and why they're not so pleasurable anymore, uh, death, social justice, relics, the sinking of the Titanic, or a pauper's grave in Europe. And so, what I like so much about your work, Tom, is the way you take these big megatopics, sex, death, you pick them up and you look underneath. So you might think it's obvious that a peanut and a, vi and a vagina are existentially and utterly different. Read Making Sex, Body and Gender from the Greeks to Troy. Think again. <laughs> you might think that masturbation is a secret sin, or that Aristotle's masterpiece, that pornography of the 18th century was the runaway bestseller in Enlightenment Guides to Sexual Pleasure. No, no, no. Read Solitary Sex, the Cultural History of Masturbation. And you might think that social life on Earth ends when it goes underground. Stay tuned. We look forward to hearing <laughs> about the work the dead do. So what I, I do want to talk about um, I want to talk about the work of the dead, and um, I want to make three claims uh, this afternoon. One of them is anthropological, um, and two of them are uh, historical. I want to suggest that there's probably no more generative or protean um, of human endeavors than arguing with the words and actions, or arguing with words against uh, <coughs> diogenes. Of course comes the collective voice of thousands of different tempers, thousands of different directions. Bodies are not refuge. They're not just the debris of life. They're not the debris left to be the scavenge. They remain part of culture, base as they, as they are. As a class of being, the dead don't revert back to nature easily. Instead, instead they bear the historical continuity of humanity. We are a species that care for the dead. We live amongst them. We make ciphers of their memory. They're guarantors of land and power and authority. They're the temporal foundations of human communities. In fact, they need, to be, they need to be cared for. And they need to be cared for less because of our views about them or about particular religious beliefs than because of a much broader set of ethical, political, cultural obligations that we, the living, owe them, we owe the dead in general and owe to the dead in particular. So I want to argue then the care that it has to do with a whole bunch of other commitments of which belief is in some way crudely put an epiphenomenon, or put differently, people care for the dead in the same way and, and articulate different reasons for doing it. But the fact of the care of the dead uh, is, is there. Let me put this differently. We care for the feelingless dead body as a product of what we, because we attribute to it all sorts of things in a primordial way. So, and the history, of how, of, of, in fact, the history of much of our, of our culture, much of what we do, um, can be written in some ways in our resistance to these claims of, of Diogenes. And the dead then become a kind of, in some sense, a sort of primal idolatry. Whatever we might purport to believe, whatever we might purport to believe about where the dead are and who they are and what they are, um, they, they are, they are of, of some, of, I would argue idolatrous significance, and it's idolatrous in the sense that they are stone, um, and yet we take them in some way to be living. It, that sort of got a technical sense of, of, a, uh, of an idol. Nope. The care of the dead is a, if not the sign of our emergence from nature into culture. It is, as the philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer puts it, the immutable anthropological background all the human and social changes, past or present. And let me read you his articulation because I think it's quite powerful. The burial of the dead is perhaps the most fundamental phenomenon of being human. Burial does not refer to a rapid hiding of the dead, 
the swift clearing away of the shocking impressions made by one so suddenly struck fast and leaden and lasting sleep. On the contrary, by a remarkable expenditure of human labor, there is thought an abiding with the dead, a holding fast to the dead amongst the living. We have to regard this in the most, of the most elementary significance. It's not as a religious matter or as a transposition of religion into secular customs and mores and so on. Rather, it's a matter of the fundamental constitution of human being from which derives a specific sense of human practice. We are dealing here with life that is spiraled out of the order of nature. I emphasize the phrase elementary significance because it keeps <clears throat> all of us in mind, of course, of Claude Levi Strauss um, and of the, of the incest of it, which Strauss famously argued is not something before and after. Uh, it's that moment, that liminal moment between, between, um, between nature um, and culture is the border of, of the nature and culture. So in some sense, my argument about the dead is in some sense the other end of the Levi Strauss you know, thing of kinship is one end, the care of the dead is the other liminal moment um, in this, in this uh, definition. And, and so each, in many cultures and places, doing, putting the dead in their proper place is usually politically important. So I could gesture it, and I've written about Isvan Rev's book on, on Hungary and exhumations in Hungary, who makes it the point that the, the Hungarian communist government falls at the moment of the, of the reburial of Remernage. And it's actually staged, and they dig him out of the zoo where he's buried with giraffes, and they move into the cemetery where the heroes of 1848 are buried. Um, and Janusz Kadra, who for years, for de decades, wouldn't speak the name, it's a fear of the necronym of, of, of Renaud, speaks the name, and this moment the regime loses its courage, and the regime falls. So there is this sort of actual moment in which a translation of a body um, does this kind of does this kind of work. Sure. This, the history of the dead, the dead doing something for the living, has very particular historical moments in particular countries, and I can only gest, and I will gesture toward 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 some of them. So let me just give you the story. So the example then I, I want to what I want to speak about is um, is the is the development of a particular necrogeography, and that necrogeography's relationship to what was understood by later observers to be civilizational time. So I'm taking, um, I want to take this from, from Gibbon's account of, of Julian the Apostate. The ruin of the pagan religion is described by the sophist as the dreadful and amazing prodigy which covered the earth with darkness and restored the ancient dominion of chaos and night. They relate in solemn and pathetic tones that the temples were converted to sepulchres and that holy places that have been adorned by statues of gods were basely polluted by the relics of Christian. Eunapius, who given quotes, is perhaps more bitter, derisive, and angry about this. He speaks of monks who live with the ruins of sacred places as men in appearance who live the lives of swine. They collected the bones and skulls of criminals, made gods of them, haunted their sepulchres, and thought that they would become better by defiling themselves at their graves. Martyrs, the dead men were called, ambassadors from the gods to carry men's gifts. <clears throat> So he sees the moment then when, you know, as you know from the, from the given, in, in given, the body is given, removes the body. Um, in the reaction against Julie, the body is brought back, and the Sybil quits speaking. So the, the given's motion is that the, the Sybil of Apollo is silenced by the body of the dead. Now, this is a, a moment, or you, you could take other moments from the fourth, fifth, sixth century, seventh century in some places, but the basic moment is that. The, that the that churches and holy places are ruled around the special dead, and that ordinary people join these special dead, and by the where we are in Europe, this matters, but probably by the ninth century, the individual burial places of, of, of the pagans are consolidated in, into Christian burial places, and basically the neck the, the necrogeography and in some sense the geography of Europe follows. So there's a there's a there's a there's a relic. Every church by the eleventh century had to have a relic. There's a relic. There's the dead body. There's the church and the civilization around the church. So it's a precise inversion of the of the classical model of of the relationship of the dead to the living. So the sacred is where the dead are, and it's the sacred dead and the other dead share of them share of in in this this sacrality built as the towns are together and together then the church and the churchyard form a congregation of the dead in deep time. And the continuity of the living community with the community of the dead. So it is actually the Christian community over time in this particular in this particular um, 
uh, uh, place. And then, conversely, not to be buried in that churchyard is to be excluded from the Christian community. So that excommunication um, means not being buried there, and, and it's a big deal. And it's a big deal in, the, in, in famous cases, and it's a big deal in small in small cases. But it, what it is, of course, is the creation of a new kind of community that did, just as just as um, um, the, the, the making of Christian cemeteries was a, was a, was a, was a creation of the dead. The dead body, like an idol, is alive. At, uh, is dead, and like an idol, it's 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 it, it's it's alive. The dead body it works alone and collectively for civilization or for particular groups in civilization. It worked in the interest of the Christian community in deep time for transcendent transcendent religion. It works today largely in the interests of history and memory, our religion, if you will, which in turn serve uh, serve other gods. The sort of epitaph that I think I have for my book is is from uh, David Hickey, Air Guitar. It's a wonderful little three, three lines. We are mortal creatures who miss our dead friends and thus can appreciate levitating tigers and portraits for Raphael for what they are. Songs of mortality sung by the prisoners of time. So largely beyond metaphysics, then the dead body conjures with this sort of magic. It's a magic, uh, as he said just before, this is a magic we can believe in. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.